Hello everyone, the day is Thursday, May 9, 2019, and this is the week in charts. Obviously, I want to thank all you guys and girls for being here. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule. So what are we talking about? Well, obviously current market conditions, and that's pretty much going to be the show, but there is a few more things I want to talk about. Uh, obviously, questions on trading. If you don't mind, keep them on the slides or keep them on topic. Just so my ADD doesn't kick in and we get the live charts, feel free to ask about anything. Also, when we do get to the live charts, hold up on your stock picks for your benefit, that is, until we get into the live charts. That way, it won't get mixed up with the questions. And also, ask about one stock at a time and then hit return. And that's also for your benefit to make sure I cover your stocks. We should have plenty enough time to get to get everybody's stocks picks uh, this week. All right. What are we talking about? Well, I think I'm going to continue, or I know I'm going to continue on. My charts and a chart show, I mean, what a concept. And this week I started poking around with the 10% system again, the TFM 10% system again last week. And there's a few things I want to show you that I've actually noticed in a mistake or two that I made uh, in my favor for a change. That's kind of nice. And I guess the big question is, is winter coming or is winter here? Today is pretty ugly. It looks like I get too caught up in things, but there are a few cracks that I've been seeing lately. Before we get into all that, there's a disclaimer screen. As you know, all predictions are about the future. Man, a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. So let's do an update on the 10% TFM system. Now, I didn't put the rules, and I should probably go back and see what the official rules were, but these are the rules that I used for the spreadsheet that I made. You want to buy when the market is less than 10% away from its 50-week high and the last two-week lows are greater than the 50-week moving average. In other words, you have two weeks of Landry light. That'll make a little bit more sense for those of you who aren't familiar with this simple little system. And then you want to exit when the market is 10% or more away from its 50-week high and the close is less than the 50-week moving average. So let me draw something in for you. So you know the genesis of this. And I know there's a lot of friendly faces here, friendly uh, because they're your veterans to the show. But for those people who are new to the show, let me just show you a couple things real quick. Here's the, the genesis of it. Here's my thinking on the whole system. The basis of technical analysis is if a market is going to go from A to C and B is somewhere in between, it's going to have to pass through B along the way. Now, I actually have a little IPO pattern that does just that, buys at B. As a general rule in stocks in general, I don't think it's a good idea to buy at B, but if you have some sort of setup, then by all means. And it's much better than trying to catch a bottom. Now, and it's, by the way, this is the whole basis of technical analysis. There's no hard and fast rules. There's no car, concrete rules when it comes to fundamentals. You can't say, well, every time a stock gets a PE of... 50, you should sell it, you know, or whatever. But if you could say, look at the charts and say, well, the market has to go through B. So the idea is to get in somewhere around B. Now, my thinking was if the market began to fall from C, in other, in other words, fall from those highs, at some point you need to bail out because it's going to go back through B on its way to A. So as long as a market is somewhere around C, you want to stay long, and if the market is to go beyond C, not beyond C, as I often joke, it's going to have to be near C in order to get beyond C, okay? So near C to beyond C, and the indices, especially the, the NASDAQ might be a little bit higher in volatility, but for the S&P 500, I figured 10% was a pretty good, nice round number to use in this. And also, the I think the media calls 10% a correction and 20% a bear market, for whatever that's worth. So, as you can see, this market here was trending nicely higher, and it was well above its 50-week moving average. And then notice it began to drop away from its highs and came back to that moving average and closed below its moving average. Now, as long as it was in, as it was in an uptrend, now this is a weekly market, remember, a weekly chart. But as long as it was in that uptrend, 
And within 10% or below that high, there was Landry light, meaning the lows were greater than the moving average. But you can see this little red line I have drawn in here is when the market was more than 10% away from its 50 week high. Now, notice a little ribbon I programmed in here at the bottom of the screen. It stays green and bullish as long as you have two things. One, Landry light, meaning, meaning that the lows are greater than the 50 week moving average. And number two, you're within 10% of that high. So as you can see at the top, the 10% away from the line is the black line. And as long as you're below that, meaning that you're less than 10% away from the 50 week high, it stays bullish. Now, if it crosses the moving average and you're still less than 10% away from the high, it's not necessarily bearish, it's neutral. Conversely, if it goes more than 10% away from its high or drops more than 10% away from its high, I should more accurately say, it doesn't immediately go bearish until and unless it closes below the 50 week moving average. So there's a tiny little bit of a whipsaw filter in here. Now, without going into a lot of details, you, you need a little bit of a whipsaw filter, but too much of a whipsaw filter is going to A, possibly get you in too late, meaning that by the time all the stars line up for your whipsaw filter, the trend is already over. And then the other danger, as I preach with too many whipsaw filters, is that you end up curve fitting to prior data. Now, back when I was a, a young punk, 20-something or even 30-something years ago, programming all these trading systems, I used to try to program out the, all those losses, which I eventually realized was a grail hunt. But you could do a really good job with historical data coming up with filter after filter after filter to keep you out of trouble. And then a few years into my programming, this guy came along, approached me. He asked me to be part of a potential hedge fund, which never did get launched, but it's just kind of a long story, endless. And he had papers upon papers and stacks of uh, books and books and books of all these charts going back all these years. And he just kept creating a new rule, a new rule, a new rule, a new rule every time something didn't go right or whatever. And a lot of this was hand tested. And he actually wrote books on how we were supposed to follow this system. And I basically, eventually, as the, as the other business partner that I got involved was was amazed that I actually fired him because it's like, <laughs> or quit, I guess would be a better way of putting it. Because it just was a grail hunt, and I knew it wouldn't work, and there were just too many rules, and it was too convoluted. But I don't mean to digress too too far. I know, too late. But the point is that if you come up with a very complex system with, with hundreds of rules like this gentleman had, and, you know, God bless him for trying. And, and you know, he was where I was five years prior. It's just going to make things too complex, and the future is always going to look different. But if you have something really simple that actually works, might not be perfect, and by the way, nothing is, the chances of you, A, following it are pretty darn good, and the chances of you not getting too confused, obviously, are good, too. And, you know, what's kind of amazing is, as simple as this little system is, if you go back and watch, like, last week's presentation, especially if you looked at the raw file, if you were here live, before I edited out some of my confusion, even I was getting confused with this simple little system that I created with, it has two rules, and that's it. So the one thing good about this, this particular system using Metastock, which, by the way, I'm an affiliate for, if you go to the Getting Started in Trading on my website, New Trading Button, you can get all the links and all from Metastock and Telechart and every, all the other tools that I use. And one day, like I hinted last week, I'm going to probably do like a tools of the trade type of presentation. So anyway, the system, again, you would get out of the market. Now, for this particular system, I really wasn't interested in creating a stop and reverse system, although if you wanted to, it could be kind of interesting to noodle with that because in this particular case, the market dropped about 95% after the signal, or at least 90% after the signal. And in case you're wondering, this is S&P 
But if you look really carefully, you might have been able to see this graphic, but it's 1929. Obviously, this was right before the Depression. And you can see, again, the close was below the 50-week simple moving average. Now, let's take a look at the last exit signal that we had back in November. So right here, you can see that you're measuring from the close to the close, okay, from there to there is a little bit greater than 10%. Well, obviously from, from here to there is about 1% or so. And then one thing I was noticing this morning is that if you don't have anything on the chart, you're at a brand new high. You're closing at a brand new high. So if you go back in time, you can see it's not a whole lot in here. Maybe back here, okay? So way back here to the left of your chart, you close a new high. You don't have anything plotted here because this would be 0% away from a new high. In other words, you have, you're at a new high. If you look down at the ribbon at the bottom of the screen, you can see that it has turned bearish when you were below that 50-week moving average. Notice that it went neutral down here when you were still within 10% of those 50-week closing highs, okay? And again, it went bearish when you were 10% or more away from those 50-week closing highs and you closed below the 50-week moving average. So there will be times where it's neutral in between and that's part of the whipsaw filter. And it can also be a bit of an early warning sign. For instance, let's look back here. Market's kind of doing really good. Whoops, begins to sell off, but we're still within 10% of that closing high. Tries a rally, nope, comes right back in, begins to implode, okay? But this is still bullish, okay? But then what happens here? You intersect the moving average. So the little ribbon down here says, wait a minute, something might be happening here. Maybe I need to back off a little bit okay or it doesn't mean i need to take any action but i need to pay attention and then notice it goes bullish again it's like okay looks like we dodged a bullet and then what happens in october it's like well wait a minute market's selling off it's going neutral i might have to take some action nope it's green again everything's okay haha -ha. right neutral again well i better pay attention and then bam you get the sell signal in here and we'll pick apart this sell signal in just a minute and you can see when we had that last sell signal, and that's your 10% line, okay? And notice that it went green again. I'm sorry, this would be the last buy signal. Notice it went green again, and you had two weeks of Landry light. So I was still pretty bearish up and then, thinking that we're just having a big picture retrace. But if you were following something like this system, you would say, well, wait a minute, maybe I need to wake up to the fact that the market is headed higher. And, you know, it's tough sometimes because you get stuck with feeling about one way about the market. And I'm always a skeptic. So even if the market's doing really well, I tend to be a skeptic. And I think you have to be to some extent. But the good thing, I think the point I'm trying to make is the good thing is if you have a little system like this, it will wake you up to the fact that maybe the market's improving. Now, I think I have another chart in here somewhere. But just in case, let me show you. It went bearish right here. Okay, so let's see right here, and then you have a close below. So from there to there, that's a pretty good slide. And I have the I have it plotted better in the spreadsheet. So I'll show you that in just one second, which we'll get to. Now, last week when I was editing the week of charts, I started looking at my spreadsheet again, and I realized that I didn't compound the the trading side of it i didn't compound the tfm system i just kept a fixed amount in the markets now obviously when you have a negative trade that goes against you but when you have a positive trade it compounds now buy and hold there is no compounding now i guess you could argue there could be some dividends and reinvestment of dividends and you know that gets kind of money pretty fast I'm sure it would probably help the system, or I'm sure it would help by hold a little bit. But if you were just trading some sort of pure instrument, let's say the spiders or something like that, or S&P futures, maybe that makes it even better. 
because you're not looking at the dividends and things like that, then it would be a little bit more apples to apples. But I wouldn't get too caught up in that. I just want to throw that out that it does get a little muddy when you factor those type of things in. You also have to realize that a dividend will decrease the index value and then the only way that dividend pays off is if the index gets back to its pre-dividend level. So again, it gets a little muddy, but if you just kind of bear with me and just stick with the actual numbers, I think it works out fairly well. And I think that it shouldn't be picked apart too much. Now, last week, I was surprised that buy and hold won. But once I put that compounding in, I realized that buy and hold did not win. And the number's a little bit worse than it was last week because we had a little bit of a slide since then. But as of last night's close, and this green means this trade is still on, if you were following the system, and you'd be up about 3%. But your buy and hold for that period of time was 936%, and the TFM was 964%. Now, I'm not trying to blow you away by that 30% difference. Actually, it's 30%. But it's only what it's probably less than 10 percent better the point is that even though the tfm system didn't win by much i mean you would have some commissions and slippage in there okay but it's only 10 trades which i'll pick apart in just one second i think the main thing to glean here is that you would avoid several diaper change moments a 40 something to 50 something percent drop and i haven't done the testing on the nasdaq but remember folks the nasdaq dropped 70 something percent in 2000 and i guarantee you that it dropped 10 percent first before it did that and i guarantee you that it closed below its 50 week moving average before a lot of that drop and i'd be willing to stick my neck out and say that Something as simple as this would have gotten you, kept you out of a lot of trouble. Now, the rest of the drawdowns aren't that huge for the buy and hold. However, 8 to 10% or 11%, that's still substantial. So let's just use 10% because it's a round number. Let's say you've got $500,000 saved up for your retirement and it's in a S&P fund. Well, it depends on... The period of time but let's say it's a fairly short period of time which is very much possible you lose 10 percent well now you're down fifty thousand dollars well go back to last october you were down fifty thousand dollars okay and you've got to be wondering because it may have taken you years and years and years to make fifty thousand if you lose fifty thousand dollars in a few weeks or ten percent of that account that has to at least if it's not keeping you up at night it's it certainly has you tossing and turning so I think being able to avoid these steep drawdowns is pretty cool. And notice that you only had these two losing trades, and they were only by a little bit, okay, 3 and 4%. And I think the one thing to gleam is, getting back to the sleeping at night, is that it will keep you out of the market for a long time. And again, my goal wasn't to create some sort of stop and reverse system that's always in the market, but rather a market timing system which times your entries and times your exits. And if there's nothing to do, you don't do anything. You wait for that market to catch up, to catch back up to its 50 week high. And the reason you don't do all time highs is, is you might give up 100% of that gain going up. But what happens is by waiting for that 50 week high, that's kind of a moving thing because next week it's going to be the high. That's 49 weeks from this week. So that high might be dropping and dropping and dropping and dropping. And eventually, when the market turns, it'll catch up. Obviously, there'll be some lag in it, but eventually, it will catch up. There's lag in everything, obviously. But 6.31 years, in other words, you're out of the market 20% of the time over 30 years and change, isn't too bad. So being out of the market for six years, I think it's a great thing, okay? Just because I'm a trader doesn't mean I have to be in and out, in and out, in and out, in and out. Although, <laughs> lately it seems like I've been a little bit like that too much with these ogres, but we might, I might be able to touch upon that in one second. Speaking of ogres, John's asking about ogres and he had to walk out. I've covered ogres in a lot of details. For those of you who don't know, an ogre is an opening gap reversal. And John, go in and watch. I've kind of beat the dead horse in these over and over in the 
learning management system under the Q&A. And it's a little bit more advanced than I want to get into in, in the weekend charts, at least for now. So go in and watch those Q&A presentations. In fact, I covered one just yesterday and talked about trading opening gap reversals, and I did some walkthroughs too. So again, getting back to the system, 10 trades in 30 years, that's not a whole lot of trading. And if you go in here and look at how many days you're in the trade, this is what, two years? This is uh, eight years maybe, round numbers. This is four or five years. So this is three years. So you're staying in for a long time. And your last trade, you'd be in for 69 days. Obviously, you'd have been in since March 1st. You would have gotten your next buy signal with this particular system. And this is what it looks like longer term. You can see that right before the last two major bear markets, you had a sell signal. This last one obviously didn't turn into a bear market, but the market did have a significant drop from then. I was looking at that right before it went live. I forget how much that drop was, but it was it was a pretty big drop. In fact, with that being the spreadsheet, I think that was in the spreadsheets, like 8% or so. So enough to make a difference. Now, if you squint your eyes, you could see you did have a sell signal like right here, and it didn't turn into the mother of all downtrends, but you did avoid a pretty big slide in here. And if you go back to that spreadsheet, if you're watching on YouTube, just rewind it, and you could see what that low of that move was and how much of that slide you avoided. And I think I said on the other slide too, other than fear of missing out during those six years where you're out of the market, there's, to me, it seems like some sort of market timing would help you sleep a little bit better. Now, some random thoughts. Some of these are left over from last week, but I did want to reiterate them and I have a few new things I want to say. Obviously, like death and taxes, some whipsaws cannot be avoided. And again, as I said earlier, don't try to program them all out. Do have some sort of whipsaw filter into what you do to keep you out of the market when things get pretty ugly. And to also protect, protect you from jumping in too early. As Greg Morris says, and I repeat, repeat ad nauseum when he visited a few years back, whipsaws are frustrating, bear markets are devastating. You can survive frustration. And I think in some of Greg's columns going back over the last year or so, he talked about a couple of whipsaws he was caught in. It happens, you know, pronounced with a silent SH. But, you know, it's nice to be out the market when, let's say, you're down 10% and then it drops another 10%. It's nice to be keeping your head while everybody else is losing theirs. Now, with just 10 trades in 30 years, now I took off the first trade. I didn't count the first trade because buy and hold would also have to make that first trade too. But like I said last week, ain't too bad. I made some very expensive homebrew, which was phenomenal. And one of my friends of a neighbor tasted some and he said, that ain't too bad. That's where that comes from. Now, buy and hold is hard to beat. Remember, it was only like 30%. And then it's probably, if you had to do the math, it's probably like an only 10%, if that much, overall gain. But again, avoiding big drawdowns is nice, and I think that's key. And the argument I often use is, and I've heard Greg say something very similar, it's like you've got a million dollars saved up for your retirement, you're about ready to retire, and it's 2007, you're feeling pretty good, you're planning your little vacations and stuff, you're getting ready to go, and then you watch the market tank over the next year, and now you have $500,000 left. Indeed, why not just hold on until it comes back? Well, because it might take 25 years or more to come back. And I've had people look at me like I pooed in my pants when I say that. But if you go in and read Layman's, which at this particular point in time, May 9, 2019, I'm giving it away on my website, you'll see that there were quite a few times where it took a long, long, long time for that market to come back. So if you're 65 or 75 years old and you're just getting around to retiring, <laughs> you know, you might not have that another 25 years. You might not be able to go back to work for 25 more years. So something to think about. Now, obviously, there's no guarantees, but every big drop has started with a little drop first. Now, the, the, the hard part is figuring out how much of a little drop do you need before you should GTFO. In other words, before you should get out 
of the way. Now for this little system, we just said, let's just say 10% because that seems like a meaningful move in something like the S&P 500. Now, I'm not trying to sell you on this system. And by the way, it's an Oprah system. You get a trading system. You get a trading system, you know? This is just some fun little research that I'm doing just to make a point. And that point is simple systems can work and keep you out of a lot of trouble. In fact, they work a lot better than more complex systems. You look at those people out there that are using the more complex stuff. I'm not going to pick on any system, anybody in particular. But I, be guarantee, I will guarantee you ask 10 people who are using this certain arcane method and you get 10 different responses. Whereas something simple like this, it's either going to be bullish, bearish, or neutral. So again, no guarantees, but every drop, every big drop has started with a small drop. All right, any questions on the simple little system? I know it's just two weeks running in this, but I think it's important, especially given the conditions of the current market. So the question is, is winter coming, or maybe a more appropriate is winter here? And Bastard John Snow has been warning about winter forever, and then winter finally came. So is winter coming in the market? Well, my quick answer to that is I don't know. But based on this morning's action, things look a little bit worse than they did as of yesterday. Now, this does not have, by the way, this does not have yesterday's data in it, I don't think. And this is a daily S&P chart. What I found interesting just by complete accident is that the moving averages have turned down. Now, these are my bow tie moving averages, which are a 10 simple, a 20 exponential, and a 30 exponential. Notice I've blown them up for you here. Now, notice on this particular day, going back a few days, the S&P 500 closed below the 10 period simple moving average. But notice that the moving average is still headed higher, okay? And then also notice on that particular day, the 20-day exponential moving average and 30-day exponential moving average are still headed higher. Now, here's where it gets interesting, and I'll learn this from Greg Morris. The day, the exact day that the close goes below an exponential moving average is the same day that the exponential moving average will turn down. Now, if you go through the start course, DaveLander.com slash members, just sign up there, go through the start course. I talk a lot about the nuances of these 30 and 20 day exponential moving averages and exponential moving averages in general and why they are good for longer term market timing or to help keep you on the right side of the market. And that could be stocks or anything else. But anyway, notice that the 10 did eventually catch up and begin to turn down, so that's significant. The reason I like a 10 simple is I like to see a true representation of price over the last two weeks, and then for 20, which is roughly one month worth of trading, and 30, which is roughly six weeks worth of trading, I like the moving average to catch up the price a little bit faster, and by accident, by playing with these moving averages, I discovered the bow tie, and we'll talk a little bit about that in just one second. But as you can see, day one, the Price goes below the 20, and what happened? Well, the moving average turned down, and day one, it also closed below the 30 exponential moving average, or I should say the first day closed below the 30-day exponential moving average. What happens? Well, the moving average turns down. So you can see these moving averages are beginning to turn on the daily chart. Now, what's the significance of that? Well, let's not get too excited just yet, but if you go back to the last bow tie signal that we had in October, you could see that from a very clean entry on that, meaning a very straightforward setup, you could see the market had a pretty darn significant drop. So when you get an all-time high and a bow tie down, it usually pays to pay attention. This is especially true when you have a weekly. Now, I'm not going to bore you and go through that again, but many times I'll show a weekly chart and I'll show what happens with those longer term moving averages, meaning that they're same averages, but aren't plotted on a weekly chart. And that, like the TFM system and other simple little systems that I show here, will help to really keep you on the right side of the market. And more importantly, it'll help to keep you out of incredibly huge drawdowns in the overall market or, or big slides. Now, like I said last week, and I've been saying ad nauseum, the V-shaped recovery in the S&P 500 has me concerned, and that's because by the time you get all the way back to the old highs, 
the market is already overbought. As I often say, it's kind of like running a race right after you just ran a race. But you can see we've gone all the way back up here. And that's a 25% run and change, which I think I have that in this chart somewhere, which is pretty significant. Now, the other thing that you, you might notice if you know your classical technical analysis is that, hey, guess what? We've got a double top in here. Now, I don't rush out and trade double tops in and of themselves but I pay attention to them, okay? Classical technical analysis is hard to use from a pure standpoint. I see certain bloggers talk about it like it's the holy grail, it's not. If you try to trade directly off of double tops and double bottoms and cups and things like that, I think you'd have a lot of problems. Head and shoulders would be another one. But if you could factor them in to what you're doing, so let's say we get a double top and then we get a first thrust or a bow tie or something like that, and it's like, aha, well, maybe I need to pay attention to that. And just real quick, and I know I say this probably almost every week, but double tops fairly rarely work in a textbook fashion like this. A lot of times what will happen is they'll do this, and then they'll stall way short of that high and then roll over, and this creates like a gatekeeper type of pattern. And then some other times they'll overshoot it. Let's get this right. They'll overshoot it and then come back down. Okay. So everybody here thinks it's the all clear. Everything's fine. Right here, everybody thinks, well, it looks like it's going back to new highs anyway. Might as well just get in. And that's what's happening when it stalls short of the old high. So not as easy as it might look even in these I, I like the old old books on technical analysis but even those old old books make it look a lot easier than it really is there we go so that run from the october lows to now or december lows i should say is 25 percent now if you go back several weeks when i was ago when i was talking about the market being overbought and people like hey dave how do you know it's overbought and this may have been in, in the members Q&A, so my apologies if it wasn't in the weekly charts. But anyway, spoiler alert, what I was saying was showing the market's performance of the last 10 years or so, the market overall often doesn't go 25%. I think back then when I was doing a presentation, this market had ran like 10%. And my point was that a market doesn't go up 10% that often in a whole year. Well, now you've got a 25% run, so that's super duper overbought. But Dave, you said it was overbought at 10%. Now it's 25%. Yeah, as I often say, overbought can always become more overbought, but you have to be prudent when you are in that overbought environment. Now, last week I said the rusty remains the rub, and that was because the other indices were still doing pretty darn good. But now the other indices are doing poorly. It's it's the rusty's just kind of like adding to the uh the problem. You can see my big concern here was that we had this big retrace rally. And just a couple of days ago, when we get the live charts, if we have time, I'll just go back to the daily chart and show you. But just a couple of days ago, we were breaking out in the Russell 2000. And you can see it on this weekly here, up around 161. But unfortunately, we've already failed in that. Now, now take a look at the energies. And as you can see, they're in a pretty serious slide as of late. And we take a look at metals and mining. They're looking a little bit uglier or a little bit more ugly and take a look at drugs drugs had a little retrace rally but now they're beginning to sell off again kind of a first thrust type of deal probably also a bow tie now health services sold off especially hard they had the mother of all retrace rallies back up but then they began to sell off again so it's kind of like thrust retrace and now it looks like we could be in a new leg lower at least for now so I'm not saying that this is the end of the world for the health service stocks, but I'm saying pay attention. And the point I'm trying to make by showing you these sectors is that the sector action is beginning to look a little bit questionable. Now, just a few days ago, things look a heck, look a heck a lot better, and I was questioning my sanity and being concerned about these few things. I'm like, am I picking this market apart? If you go to retail and quite a few other sectors, you'll see that the V-shaped recovery at high levels problem exists. In other words, very overbought longer term. And then of course, correcting now gives you that textbook double top.
Now, here's one thing of concern. The semis, which is one of my favorite sectors to help me in my market timing. I'm not, I don't worry about the transports as much or as much as a lot of people. I just say, well, let's see what the transports are doing. And if they're supporting the market, that's great. If they're not, eh, just put it, put that in a negative column, but don't get too excited. But when I see the semiconductors and some of these other technology areas breaking down, I begin to get a little bit more concerned. So now the semis have done a round trip on their breakout, and the semis have been looking fantastic for quite a while, and now they're beginning to look a little bit more dubious. Now, there are some areas that still look pretty darn good, like software. I don't want to paint just a a bearish picture here and, and by the way we're still within a few percent I guess a few more percent today away from all-time highs in the overall market so let's not freak out just yet but I think it's important to pay attention to what's going on and again maybe I'm hearing myself talk out loud maybe I am a bit of a skeptic but I think you have to be a little bit of a skeptic okay so software so far just kind of pulling back and a few other tech areas doing okay in here. All right, any questions or thoughts about the overall market? We're going to jump into the live slides and just the live charts in just one minute so we can certainly circle back to anything you might want to do there. Okay, why we use money management? Yet another one of Big Dave's keep calm and beat the dead horses. As I wrote my last now column and talked about in yesterday's Q&A, I saw one individual in particular, there's probably more, that took a trade that was mentioned in the Facebook group, and I think I was the one who mentioned it, and did quite well for a while, and then ended up losing money. And that's why I said shame in my now column. And this is what the trade looks like. It was a buy at B and TIGR. Stock took off nicely. It gave us partial profits. And unfortunately, it began to implode and stopped us out. Now, if memory serves, and I'm 99% accurate on this, I made 3% overall on the trading account that I traded this stock in because I risked 2%, I took 1% profits, and I think by the time I stopped out, I ended up with 2% profits on the second low. So 3% overall over a couple of weeks' time, better than a poke in the eye. This is not why I'm here. I'm not here to make 3% on my account on a trade. I'm here to catch that huge big winner where I make 10% or 20% on my account on that big outlier. But smoke them if you got them. In other words, take those partial profits. And when you get stopped out, so long and thanks for all the fish. And you can see we came all the way back in below the entry price. So this really nice trade which happened over a couple of weeks. And then when you get stopped out, drop your F-bombs, yeah. And I dropped a few, okay, admittedly, I'm still human. But then move on and scream next and find your next big opportunity. Now, by the way, if you are a member of DaveLander.com, a gold member, make sure you join the Facebook group because we've had quite a few good posts lately there. And I've really been enjoying the interaction. My ultimate goal with the members area is to get everybody up to speed, no matter what level you're at, whether you're just beginning, I don't know if that's proper English, but whether you're a newbie or a little bit more advanced and might need a little tweaking. And that's why we have the learning management system in place, which took a long time to build. And I think it's pretty cool if I say so myself. Anyway, the ultimate goal would be to get everybody up to speed, everybody educated, and then we go out and we help each other like we have been so far in the Facebook group. So the ultimate goal is to reach that mastermind status. Okay, and this is just a post left over from last week, but this is a buy it, be type of setup, another one of those money management type of things that worked out okay, but didn't work out longer term, okay? If you guys want and girls want to start asking about individual stocks, feel free to start doing so now, and I'll go ahead and get my telechart shared. All right, Chris, uh, you're, yeah, I'll get to you next. Keep them coming. So I have a few and won't uh, lose any flow. So let's take a look at these live charts, S&P 500. I am looking to play an opening gap reversal here today, but so far that has not happened. And I know John was asking me to talk about ogres. And what I recommend you do, like as you can see, like yesterday, is you have to make that no or go no decision on the first five minute bar when it rallies. But if you give it a little wiggle room, 
like yesterday, sometimes you can avoid getting into a stinker of a trade. And so today I sat on my hands in the first five minutes and so far I have not made an opening gap reversal trade. But if we begin to take out this high in here, then I might go in for a little bit of a trade. But as you can see, not the end of the world just yet, but market has begun to drop substantially from the recent highs in here. And then by the way, there was a really good opening gap reversal. And if you are a gold member, go in and watch the Q&A. We talked about that. Actually, that won't post until Friday, tomorrow, 5, 10, 19. So if you're watching this after the night, after the 10th of May, 2019, Go in and watch what I did with this, with the trade war scare or whatever it was on Monday. I try to ignore the news, but I get a little bit through osmosis, truth be told. So NASDAQ looking pretty ugly, recovering off its worst levels, but still gapping lower today. And finally, the Rusty. Rusty looking pretty ugly too, but it's nicely off its lows so far, but still down a percentage change nonetheless. And again, my big fear here is that it just broke out a few days ago and now it came right back in and that could have faked out some people so as you go through these sectors this metals and mining as i said a few minutes ago continue to slide in here conglomerates a few areas like non-durables hanging in there but that's nothing to get too excited about obviously take a look at banks they got thwarted at that overhead supply and what else is happening? Drugs still look questionable at best. So you can see a lot of sectors still hanging in there. Some like retail making that double top look. And then quite a few have already entered into bona fide slides. Let's take a look at the transports. Transports getting thwarted at recent peak, kind of like the S&P 500 itself. Hardware, in other words, Apple. That's kind of the example of stalling short of the prior peak in a double top. But you can see, fairly serious slide. They're not the end of the world, still in an uptrend, but you certainly want to pay attention. Okay, I think that's enough for the sector action. It's QHC. This looks pretty good. It does have some overhead supply to deal with. It is a cheap stock, but that's okay. Uh, I would probably pass. It's got a little bit of overhead supply. And you know, maybe I'm just kind of picking it apart. HV is a little high, a little overhead supply. It's not set up today. So let's just maybe watch it, put it on your watch list. Maybe it pulls back a little bit in here because obviously if it's making a new high today, you don't want to buy when it's making a new high. We're not buying on breakouts. Trigger two days ago. Yeah, sort of. You know, I can kind of pick this apart a little bit. It Technically, it was like... Um, a first thrust. I'm sure it's also a bow tie. Yeah, it's a bow tie. You know, you just got like one big day in there. That's your thrust higher because it's a cheap stock. I mean, that's like, what is that percentage wise on that one day? It's just something kind of ridiculous. HV is 113. Let's see the low for the day. Yeah, it's a 22% move in one day. It's just a little crazy, but I hear you. Yeah, I would have. And, and then the other thing is you probably want to want to use a little bit higher entry so yeah i hear you it would have triggered technically i guess today it would have triggered okay i would have given it a little bit of wiggle room you're welcome chris omp no this is just too too sideways too wide listen sideways where is it now where was it a month or so ago uh, it's kind of all over the place i think you could probably find something still find something that's trending out there also look at the volume Less than 50,000 shares on average. You know, you go to buy, let's say, even 1,000 shares and you're 4% of the day's volume. If I did my math right. Or at least 2% of the day's volume. No, I would pass on that. Baba. Uh, what do you want to do with that, Frenchie? It is a foreign stock, so we've got to decide whether or not we're going to give it a pass or not on gaps. Um, you know, this thing has imploded. It not only has imploded, it's taken out almost its entire range. It tried to break out and then sold off fairly hard. I wouldn't rush out and trade this, but if you, when you go through your charts and study charts, notice that a lot of times you're going to break out, and if they fail and it takes out the bottom of the range decisively, that'll actually test out. Okay, kind of a breakout, fake out pattern. Okay, so in addition to it failing shorter term, longer term, I'm not a big fan of buying these big pullbacks 
when they're going into their old highs like this. And then also, you could argue that there's just a tremendous amount of overhead supply. So this stock is kind of all over the place. I think you could play something clean and play the trade war. Eh, that's a bad idea. I hear you, Frenchie. Um, no, it's dangerous. That's a dangerous game. Now, if you want to play the trade war and you feel like you have to, then I would do something like yin and yang. And the problem is the move is going to happen overnight, okay? So, like, you come in today, it's down, what, 8%, the yen? Then maybe look to play that opening gap reversal there if you want to play that day, that uh, trade war game. Kind of dangerous, though. And then, you know, this uh, this yen is all over the place. But, yeah, that would be one way to play it. Wait for a big gap like today and look to play an opening gap reversal, maybe, like, right above this high. But the problem is it's a foreign stock. So, I don't know, these trend days like this where you get a nice move higher, I think those are kind of few and far between. A lot of times you just get like a little tiny move where you probably scratch out or even lose on a trade like this, even on a nice gap. And then, of course, the next day it just rockets higher. But this is something that you wouldn't want to hold overnight, I don't think. But let me just throw that out there as something to look at. Hey, Ron, good to see you, buddy. OMP. Okay, we already talked about that. Yeah, Ron, um, everything I just said, too wide and loose. All right, any more? All right. Well, obviously, I want to thank our, all you guys and girls for attending. I appreciate you taking time on a busy schedule. Any unanswered questions, two things. Go to my website. Go to daveleonard.com slash contact. Put it in there so it'll put you in the system, and I'll either answer it in the next Q&A or the next week of charts if it's answers that require a lot of thought. And if you don't have access to the members area, maybe I'll be nice enough to give you access so you can attend the next Q&A to get your answer. All right, everybody, thanks again. Everybody enjoy your weekend if we don't talk between now and then. Thanks so much.